For the past 20 years, quantum computers have been relegated to the lab for one main reason. Decoherence. By destroying the information in your computation, decoherence sets a maximum size of problem that quantum computers can solve right now. But Google may have just found a way around it. In 1995, David Wineland made the first quantum bit, a controlled quantum system which could be switched between two specific states, labeled 0 and 1, at will. He and his team did this using a highly engineered ion trap. Inside the oscillating magnetic and electric field were trapped individual beryllium ions, with each ion holding a single quantum bit of information. But there was a problem. The lifetime of these qubits was very short. This doesn't refer to the lifetime of the physical quantum computer itself, but rather the lifetime of the information inside it. Think of it like a really bad hard drive, where every one microsecond or so, the data in the hard drive is wiped and you have to start over. If you wanted to do a computation that lasted longer than one microsecond, you'd be out of luck, because your data from the computation would have already been erased. This was effectively the problem with qubits. Quantum bits are characterized using two metrics, T1 and T2. T1 describes the time over which the state of a qubit is stable. Basically, this means the time it takes for a bit to flip randomly. Some of you may be familiar with this concept from regular computers due to infamous instances of cosmic rays inducing bit flips. Like in this Mario speedrun, where a single bit flip caused by a cosmic ray hitting the Game Boy on which it was played resulted in the player jumping several levels instantaneously. T2 describes the stability of the energy levels over time. If we go to the analogy of classical computers, a high T2 would have very stable on-off conditions for the switch. Say for example, applying 0 volts to your switch opens it, giving you a 0, and applying 5 volts closes your switch, giving you a 1. In this analogy, a high T2 would mean that these 0 and 5 volt numbers are very stable. And more importantly, that the difference between them, 5 volts in this case, is stable. If we actually explain this in the context of a qubit, instead of thinking about high and low voltages on a transistor or switch, we can instead think about the qubit's energy levels. If the qubit's energy levels are stable over time, it'll have a high T2. If the qubit's energy levels shift a lot over time, then the qubit will have a relatively lower T2. Often, T1 errors are referred to as bit flip errors, whereas T2 errors are known as dephasing errors. In large-scale quantum computers, the problems of bit flip and dephasing errors are exacerbated by the fact that many qubits must be kept in close proximity to one another in order to have interactions between qubits. In these devices, unwanted interactions, also known as crosstalk between individual qubits, can cause more errors. Both of these times together, T1 and T2, along with this crosstalk, make up decoherence. This means that if you just scale up a quantum computer to several tens or hundreds of qubits, you actually decrease the performance of each qubit. The crosstalk caused by these unwanted interactions actually decreases the coherence of your quantum processor. But this is counterproductive. If we want to make a useful quantum computer, it needs to be scalable. As we add qubits, it's got to get more powerful, not less. Many different research groups attempted to tackle this problem from a variety of angles. If trapped ions were going to decohere, what about other systems? Researchers tried neutral atoms, NV diamond centers, spin qubits, superconducting qubits, and many more. While all of these platforms offer various advantages and disadvantages, they all unfortunately suffer from decoherence limitations in one way or another. NV diamond centers have exceptionally long T1 times, but relatively short T2 times. Spin qubits have long coherence times until you couple them together in a processor, where they suffer from crosstalk. Superconducting qubits are limited to coherence times below 1 millisecond and also suffer from significant crosstalk. With all of these limitations, adding new hardware platforms just won't cut it. Rather, we need something more clever. And that's exactly what Google's engineers came up with. A method of engineering these quantum systems to improve their coherence. They found this paradigm shift by taking inspiration from classical computers. While individual transistors are not very error-prone, events like cosmic rays hitting a processor, like we saw before, can still cause problems if we don't correct the errors that occur. Therefore, we need some form of error correction. The simplest form of error correction is known as a repetition code. By copying data from your transistors to other transistors elsewhere in the chip, you protect against errors that occur in single transistors. Now for an error to happen, many transistors have to fail. And more than that, they must fail in the exact same way at the exact same time. Unfortunately, while this seems straightforward, we actually can't implement this in quantum computers due to the no-cloning theorem. The no-cloning theorem states that, in order to copy the state of a qubit, 
we would have to destroy the information in that qubit. In other words, we can only transfer information from one qubit to another, but we can't copy it. Luckily though, there is a solution. It's possible to use several qubits together to create a logical qubit. By using a combination of operations and measurements on the collection of qubits, it's possible to make it act as if it were a single qubit with significantly improved coherence times. Five physical qubits is the lowest number of qubits required to make a single protected logical qubit. But by increasing the number of qubits working together in the logical qubit, it should be able to get more performance gains. Thus, the bigger the logical qubit, theoretically at least, the better. But this is only theoretically. In practice, making these error-corrected logical qubits is a very difficult task. Since individual qubits are so noisy, as researchers tried to increase the number of qubits in a logical qubit, the logical qubits performed worse. In fact, nobody has been able to make a logical qubit which gets better as you add more physical qubits. At least, not until now. In 2024, Google published a paper titled Quantum Error Correction Below the Surface Code Threshold, in which they demonstrated specific error correcting codes known as surface codes. These surface codes are characterized by a distance, either 3, 5, or 7, which tells you the number of physical qubits in the logical qubit. A distance 3 surface code contains 17 physical qubits, a distance 5 code contains 49, and a distance 7 code contains 101 physical qubits. In this paper, Google demonstrated that their distance 5 code outperformed their distance 3 code, and their distance 7 code outperformed both their distance 5 and 3 codes, a massive improvement from the rest of the industry, which has until this point only seen error correction techniques get worse as the number of qubits increased. Furthermore, this is the first case of quantum error correction below the break-even point, meaning that the logical qubit made with the distance 7 surface code was actually better than the individual qubits making it up by a factor of 2.5 in this case. This was the first experimental evidence supporting the fact that quantum computers can and will get more powerful as we scale them up. For a quantum computer to be usable for anything other than academic research, it needs to be resistant to errors, or at least much closer to that than we currently have. This means that error rates must be lowered sufficiently such that they can be corrected faster than they can come up. Once we reach this fault tolerance threshold, Quantum computers will have the ability to run complex computations to solve some of the most intricate problems from chemistry and finance to cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. For the time being though, while this is a great step, it still isn't the fault tolerance threshold required for quantum computers to be adopted at wide scale by industry. That said, progress is certainly trending in the right direction. If you liked this video, leave a thumbs up, and if you want me to cover a specific topic or news in the world of quantum, leave a comment down below. Until next time, I've been Lucas, this has been Lucas's Lab, and thanks for watching.